The scripture reading is taken from Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 29. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace, heated seven times hotter than usual, and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent And the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, Governors and royal advisers crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be back, and I'm glad to have uh, be able to get right into this uh, uh, series that we've been doing through the summer and into the early fall. Each week, we're looking at some place in the Old Testament where God appears visibly, audibly. Um, these manifestations or appearances of God are called by theologians theophanies, and each week we're looking at one of them. Uh, But we find each week, as we look at the theophanies, that each one of them tells us something about Jesus, because Jesus is the ultimate theophany, the ultimate um, appearance, manifestation of God to our minds and our eyes and our hearts. And so each week we're going to learn something about Jesus, and there's nothing more important to learn about than that. Now, this very dramatic passage Uh, is in front of us, and the background to it is that 6th century B.C., 600 years before Christ, Babylon is the uh, preeminent 
power in the world and they are a great empire and they've been conquering people. And one of the things they do and what they have done to Israel is uh, they went in and conquered Israel and then they deported, they exiled the professional classes. The professional classes, that is the artisans and the and the scholars and the govern, uh, people in government, the military officers, they took the professional classes and made them live in Babylon. Now, why? Well, that's a strategy, and the strategy is subjugation through assimilation. The idea was that these, that these other countries that were resisting the rule of Babylon, what you do is you defeat them, you take the professional classes, make sure that they they grow up in the culture of Babylon, and in a generation or two, two, they will assimilate. They will adopt the, um, the, the values and the standards, and they will lose their own distinct culture and beliefs and, and, uh, and values, and, uh, and therefore will stop resisting the claims of the empire. And the book of Daniel is a story about one man in particular, one of the exiles, one of the Jewish exiles, Daniel, and his three friends, uh, there's a couple of stories about them, including this one, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and about their confrontations in Babylon with the emperor, with the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And this is a very famous passage, very dramatic passage, and we're going to learn three things. I'd like to at least point out three things from the passage. We're going to learn about the pressure of pluralism, the precision of true faith, and the promise of suffering or the promises of suffering. The, uh, in other words, we're going to be looking at the pressure, the precision, and the promises. First, the pressure of pluralism. Um, start at the top. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, in the first part of the chapter, this is what we're told. Nebuchadnezzar had built a giant image of gold, uh, 90 feet high, and he had surrounded it uh, with orchestras and put it in a very public place. And the decree was, which is actually re- recapitulated here in this first paragraph, the decree was that if anybody was in that public place and was uh, near, uh, was able to see the, uh, the image, and w- if the music suddenly began, then anyone who could see it had to bow down and worship the image, had to bow before the image. And, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wouldn't do it. And the, uh, the decree was that if they didn't bow down to this image, they'd be thrown into the blazing furnace. That was the decree. Now, what did, what did, what did the image mean? What did it mean? And uh, it's interesting that if you read the whole chapter, you'll see that it's never given a name. Uh, you would think, well, it must represent one of the Babylonian gods, but it's never given a name. The Babylonians had a number of gods, but it's never given a name. And actually, Nebuchadnezzar gives us a hint as to what it represented in the very question. Uh, There's a couple ways of translating this because there's a little Hebrew word there that can be translated or or by. And here's what probably would be the best and most clear way to translate verse 14. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods by worshiping the image of gold I have set up? Very interesting. And it makes sense. The image of gold does not represent one god. It represents all the gods and the values, see, and the beliefs and essentially the culture of Babylon. And so Nebuchadnezzar knows that this is a multinational and multi-ethnic city. It's a pluralistic city. And there are people from many lands there, and they all have their different religions, and they all have their different gods. What he's saying is to everyone, I am not asking that you worship my gods, the the, the Babylonian gods, uh, instead of your God, I am asking that you worship the Babylonian gods in addition. He's saying, sure, you can worship what gods you want, but in public, bow down to the image. And so when you say, oh, you can worship your gods as long as you don't say your gods are the only gods. You can worship your God as long as you also acknowledge our gods at the same time. And of course, in the Babylonian culture, what that meant was you had to privatize your faith. You could, in private, you could worship the God of Israel, but in public, you had to be like everybody else. The values, the way you lived, had to be like everybody else. Now, here's what we learn. All great pluralistic societies, all great pluralistic cities, Babylon, Rome, and New York City, do the same thing. 
The pressure is the same. What the, all pluralistic societies say is, you can pr- privately worship the way you want, but public culture, you must be like everybody else. Do not think that your religion has exclusive claims. You can be, you can be religious in any way you want in, pri- in private if it helps you, but in public, you've got to be like everybody else. And that is how all pluralistic societies work. It always seeks to assimilate you in the public culture by making you privatize your faith. Got it? So let me give you a couple examples of how it does it today. If you're a Christian and you're in the business world today, in New York, let's say, if you're a Christian and you're in the business world today, um, and all the people around you are ruthless in their business practices and just barely legal, that makes, that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on you because they're your competitors or they're your colleagues. And in a sense, they're your competitors even if you work in the same firm. You know that. Because the bottom line is, what are you producing? And so there's a, if you're a Christian and you decide, I'm going to have to be as ruthless, I'm going to have to be as barely legal as everybody else, then you have succumbed to the pressure. You are bowing to the image. You, you say you're a Christian and privately you're a Christian. And you say you believe all the things that Christianity teaches about uh, attitudes and relationships, etc. But when it comes to how you're actually living your life in the world, you're just like everybody else. You bowed. See? Uh, or let me give you another example, and I'm going to get back to this book in about a month. But it's, it's too, uh, it fits this uh, situation, fit, fits the, the point we're making right here. Uh, a couple of sociologists uh, recently have come out with a massive study. It, Called at Oxford University Press called Premarital Sex in America. It's a, a massive empirical study of, of the uh, behavior, sexual behavior of younger people. And here's something interesting. Here, there's two groups of men there, uh, that, that they studied in this country. There were um, unmarried, college-educated males age 18 to 23. Got that? And they looked at two groups of... Uh, two groups of unmarried, college-educated males, 18 to 23. One group were raised in communities in which they and the communities did not think there was anything wrong with sex outside marriage. And the other group were raised in churches and families where they did believe that there was something wrong with sex outside marriage. So you have two groups, unmarried, college-educated, 18 to 23. First, a group that say, we don't think there's anything wrong with sex outside marriage. And the second group says, we do believe that there's something wrong with sex outside marriage. The first group the group that says, I don't believe there's anything wrong with sex outside of marriage, only 23% of them are virgins in this country. The second group, the people who say, I do believe there's something wrong with sex outside of marriage, there are 28% of them are virgin. Okay. And sociologists said, in other words, there's two groups of people, one group that's raised and believe that sex outside of marriage is wrong, one group doesn't, but the way they're actually practicing their lives, there's no difference. I mean, the difference between 23% and 20% is essentially negligible. Why? And the sociologists say it's pretty simple. Your church tells you something about sex, your culture tells you something about sex, and you're believing what the culture tells you. So in other words, you say, well, I believe in Christianity, I believe this and that, in private, but in public, everybody else, you've succumbed, you're bowing to the image. And all pluralistic societies put this pressure on us to assimilate to public culture by privatizing our faith. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will have none of it. Now, we've got to be very careful here. Who are these guys? Now, you, you know, if you read the first two chapters and chapter three, you'll know this. These are not people who ha- are in a tiny little spiritual enclave withdrawn from the world. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, are deeply involved in the culture of Babylon. They have gotten a Babylonian education. They are all working in public service. They're working in the government. They are deeply involved. They are deeply engaged. They very much are part of the city. They're doing what Jeremiah 29 said they should do as exiles. They should love the city and pray for the city and work for the prosperity of the city and engage themselves in the cultural and economic uh, 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 activities of the city. But when they're asked to privatize their faith, they say no. And we don't care what the consequences are. It's very brave. I just want to ask you a question. If you're a Christian living, not just in New York City, but in almost any place in the West, you're under the same pressure. If you don't know you're under the same pressure, you've given into it. 
if you are not getting any, if you're not getting a bloody nose ever over this, if you're never resisting the pressure and taking it on the chin sometimes, you've just given into it. Are you resisting? So there's the pressure of pluralism. Secondly, second thing we learn here is about the precision of true faith. Now, what do I mean by precision? Oh, now, all right. So Nebuchadnezzar's angry. They are not bowing down. What do they say? Go down to verse 17 and 18, two of the most wonderful uh, declarations in the Bible. They say to Nebuchadnezzar, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now look how remarkable that is. Look at the first part of that statement. They said, we believe that our God is able to save us. He can save us and rescue us from your hand. Not only that, they don't just say that he's, he can we believe he, he will, he wants to. But if he does not, and literally in the Hebrew it just says, but if not. Our God can save us, O king. Our God, we think, will save us, O king. But if not, we're not going to bow down to that image. Now, Albert Barnes, one of the old uh, um, commentators, looks at this verse and says, here are men of principle, and I guess. And here's what they're saying, but I'd like to go a little further than just principle. You know what they're saying? They are saying, Nebuchadnezzar, we serve and love God for himself, not for what we get out of him. We serve and love God. We trust God himself. We love him for himself, not just for what he gives us. Do you see? Listen, I can't tell you how many times over the years as a pastor I've talked to people who said, I trusted God, I lived a good life, and then I asked him for some really important things, and he didn't come through. They didn't happen. So I trusted God, I really trusted God, and he didn't come through for me. Well, not exactly. You didn't quite just trust God. You know what? You had God balled up with your agenda. The real hope, the real thing that mattered, the thing that you really, really were were really trusting in and hoping in was this agenda. And you thought, if I obey God and I pray to God, God will give me this agenda. And when the agenda didn't transpire, you're out of there, right? So it was, you really weren't trusting God. You were trusting God plus, plus, plus. God plus this, God plus that. God, and if it all happens, fine. If it doesn't all happen, no. They're saying, we just trust God, period. Not God plus, 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 plus. God. We obey him just because he's worth it. We trust him and love him and serve him for himself, not for what we get out of it. You see how precise their faith is? (laughs) They are precisely believing in God, not God plus, 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 plus. And as a result, they can handle anything. In fact, you know, behind, you know, behind this statement, he will rescue us, but if not, doesn't matter. Maybe something that all believers know. And that is, yes, God can always rescue you from death, but he will always, if you're a believer, rescue you through death. Because you see, if you die in him and you wake up in his arms, there's nothing but freedom and liberation and joy. And therefore, you see that you're always safe. When these men said... We think our God, we actually believe our God's going to deliver us, but if not, we don't care. We're not going to bow down to your image. They'd already won. Before they were even thrown into the furnace, they already won. They were spiritually fireproofed before they were physically fireproofed. Yeah, spiritually fireproof, they could handle anything because they trusted God alone, not God plus, 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 plus. And therefore, they could handle anything. They were spiritually fireproof before God actually did make them physically fireproof, which leads to the third point. And by the way, you can be too. If you're willing to to be more precise in your faith and not just trust God plus plus your agenda, plus this, plus that, but God for who he is in himself. You want to be loved for yourself, right? Not for your money. You want to be loved for yourself, not for your looks. Because as time goes on, by the way, your money and your looks can go away. You hope when somebody loves you, they love you for you. Isn't that right? Why should God be different? In fact, why God isn't different. You should love him precisely for himself. And if you do, 
you be spiritually fireproofed as well. Now, that leads to the third. The third thing we see here are, I, I, I should have said, the promises of suffering. Now, um, what happens? Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 19. Now, you know what happens? Here's what happened. He is white hot with fury, and he wants the furnace as hot as his anger. And so what he does is he has his servants uh, heat the fire seven times hotter than it was, and they have, then he has Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound and thrown into the furnace, and the furnace is so hot that the soldiers who are p- throwing them in die because of the heat. And then Nebuchadnezzar goes to some place, obviously far away, um, some vantage point, some place where he could look into the furnace, and he sees two shocking things, two shocking things. And the first thing is he sees these three guys walking around. They're just walking around. I mean, his soldiers died from just getting near the furnace, and here they are inside the furnace walking around. But that's only the first shocking thing. The second shocking thing is it's not just three. And the fourth, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is sort of at a loss for words. The fourth one looks, he says, like a son of the gods. And so they're saved. After all, they are rescued by God. What do we learn here? Well, in the Bible, furnaces are a metaphor. Fire is a metaphor for trials and suffering and trouble. And therefore, we have depicted for us here are at least three truths that the rest of the Bible tells us about suffering that you need to know because you are going to suffer. Everybody is. So what are those three things? Well, the first one is the least important, but it's important to just mention here. First thing the Bible tells us about suffering is it's an inevitable. Uh, you know, uh, for example, Job 5, verse 7, Dear, uh, man is born to trouble as surely as the sparks fly upward. One of my favorite verses. But a little more pointed, 1 Peter four twelve. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. And I let me indulge me here. I would, especially since we're in America right now, Americans are uh, the people on the whole face of the earth, Americans struggle with suffering the most. That almost everybody else expects suffering to be inevitable, not Americans. We think if there's something, if, if I'm suffering, somebody's doing something wrong. You see, and there's a couple ways of looking at that. Uh, you know, one of them is just, uh, you know, I've often talked to Americans who say, but I'm living a good life. I shouldn't be suffering. Okay, well, Jesus lived a perfect life and his life was filled with suffering. So why should you have a pass? A pass, you know, a pass, uh, you know, because life, life, there are furnaces in life. The, there's fire. You will walk through the fire. So the first thing the Bible promises is don't be surprised. And I, one of the reasons why it's worth to take another 15 seconds to mention this is as a pastoral counselor, I have to tell you how often I've talked to people who are devastated this much because of suffering, and half the devastation is the fact that they're shocked that I even suffer. You know, it, you know the, devis, the, the, the effect would be half as great if they weren't. They're not just suffering. They're shocked that they're suffering. And the shock is half of what's de- devastating them. And get, get over that. It's, you know, everybody, I tell anybody who, you know, if you die an early death, that's pretty bad. But if you live to 50 or 60 years old or past that, you're going to suffer. It's just inevitable. It happens. So that's the first thing. But the second and third are, <laughs> are more important. The second thing that the Bible promises about suffering that is depicted here is that suffering, if you believe in him and you rest in him, then suffering will relate to your character like fire relates to gold. Suffering will relate to your character like fire relates to gold. So First Peter 1, 7, for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, your faith, that's your character. It's like gold going through the fire. What what does the fire do to gold? I mean, it's an intense experience, of course, but it actually makes it better, makes it more beautiful, makes it purer. What does that mean? Well, uh, there would be a whole sermon, but think of four things. Do you want to know your own heart? 
Don't you want to know who you are? Do you realize how, what a mess your life's going to be, how many bad decisions you're going to make, how many bad relationships you're going to conduct if you don't know really who you are and what's really in your heart, your strengths and weaknesses? Secondly, do you want to be a sympathetic person, a compassionate person, a person who really helps people, who feels, uh, you know, has a certain empathy and compassion and sympathy for other people? Do you want to really have a profound trust in God so that you really put all of your weight on him? Do you just want to be wise about life? You need suffering. None of those things are achievable without suffering. I mean, you might say, if, 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 you, if that seems outrageous, I don't have the time to make the case. Not here. But I'm afraid to a lot of you, you know it's true. I don't think that many of you think it's outrageous. There's no way to really know how, who you really are until you're tested. There's no way to really learn how to trust in God until you're drowning. There's no way to really empathize and sympathize with their suffering people unless you've suffered yourself. There's no way to really become just wise about how life works. Suffering, if you hold on to him as you're going through, suffering relates to character as fire relates to gold. That's the second promise. But the third promise is most important because, as some people are going to say, does it mean it's automatic? As soon as, if you suffer, you just automatically become a better person? No, we all know that's not true. Plenty of people have been broken by suffering, terrible broken. So what do you have to do in order to grow instead of be destroyed by your suffering? And the answer is you need to know, and it's most so beautifully depicted here, the Bible says, God says, if you trust in me, I'll be walking with you in the furnace. Isaiah 43, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be there. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you, for I am the Lord your God. I will be with you. But it's not just God in general. I mean, it, uh, who is this one who was there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that Nebuchadnezzar says, he looks like a son of the gods. And by the way, the word for gods there is Elohim. He looks like a son of God. But actually, by the way, did you catch it? Nebuchadnezzar does a pretty good job of nailing who this is because did you see, he doesn't just call him the son of the gods. He refers to this person one more time. It's in verse 28 when he says, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel. And we're not just talking here. In the Old Testament, we've, I hope, you know, if you've been here for any of the, of the series, there, there are angels, but there's the angel of the Lord. And when the angel of the Lord shows up, it's not like Gabriel who says, here's what God says. When the angel of the Lord shows up, he speaks as if he is God. And that's who's in the fire. It's God in a visible form. It's God in a manifestation. And therefore, it is a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus himself. And now, how can you get yourself to the place where when you go through suffering, it's turning you into gold? instead of into something else. You need, this is what you need to know. You will feel Jesus Christ walking with you in your furnace to the degree you know that Jesus Christ was thrown into the ultimate furnace for you. If Jesus, if you remember that Jesus was thrown into the ultimate furnace for you, you will feel him in your cooler, smaller furnaces with you. Let me explain what I mean. Jonathan Edwards, years ago, wrote a wonderful sermon, preached a sermon called Christ's Agony about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember how in the Garden of Gethsemane Jesus is, is struggling? He's sweating. He's sweating. And he's sweating great drops of blood, and he's in agony. And what is that agony? Here's what Jonathan Edwards, here's how he interprets it. Edwards says, and Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane had then a near view of the furnace of God's divine wrath into which he was about to be cast, a furnace vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. Jesus was brought at the garden, in the garden, to the place where he stood and viewed its raging flames. He saw the glowings of its heat that he might know what he was about to suffer. This was the thing that filled his soul with sorrow and darkness. This terrible sight, as it were, overwhelmed him. The gospel is that you and I, because we don't love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, we don't love our neighbors ourselves, we deserve to be cast away from God. We deserve to lose God forever when we die. 
And because we were built for God's presence, to lose God forever means to be in agony. It's, me, it's hell. It's a furnace. But the, Jesus Christ came to earth and on the cross experienced that wrath that we deserve. In other words, he was thrown into the ultimate furnace, the furnace that we deserve. And that's how we're saved. When we believe in him, then that, none of that wrath comes to us. Now, at the very end of this whole passage, Nebuchadnezzar speaks prophetically more than he knows. He says, no God can save like this. See that? No God can save in this way. And that's right. And from the New Testament perspective, we know. Look at every other religion. Every other religion has, every religion has a way of salvation. Every religion has a way of salvation. But what is every other religion's way of salvation? It's if you live a good life, if you do this, if you do that, then God will save you. Well, what does that do? If that's your belief, what does that do when suffering comes? When suffering hits and you're trying to live a good life, you're either going to hate God because you're saying, I live a good enough life. I've lived a good life. Why are you letting this happen to me? So you'll be in despair that way. Or you may get down on yourself and you say, oh, I haven't lived a good life and you'll have despair that way. In other words, if you, every other God, every other religion gives you a way of salvation based on good works and performance and moral effort. And I want you to know, when you go into the furnace with that set of beliefs, it'll destroy you. The furnace will destroy you. You either be mad at God or mad at yourself or mad at both. But if you say to yourself, when you get thrown into the furnace, you say, this is a cooler, smaller furnace. This is not being punished for my sins because Jesus was thrown into the ultimate furnace for me. And that means, oh, that means that what I'm going through right now, oh, if he went through that steadfastly for me, I can go through this steadfastly for him. And I also know that it means that if I trust in him, this furnace will only make me better. He suffered, not that I might not suffer, but that when I suffer, I become like him. You see, if you remember Jesus Christ being thrown into the ultimate furnace for you, you will sense his presence in your cooler, smaller furnaces with you, and it will turn you to gold. No God can save like this God. Let us pray. Our Father, how grateful we are that... um, Though we have these great pressures to assimilate, though we, have, uh, though we have imprecise faith that just sometimes uh, confuses us because we tend to put our agenda in with, with you and your glory, though we have uh, furnaces that we find ourselves falling into and we're very confused, in spite of all these pressures and all these uh, difficulties, This text, as well as any text, tells us you're you're going to walk with us through them. In fact, it tells us you have walked through the greatest furnace for us, O Lord Jesus. And we know that if we understand the gospel and we think about it and we understand, we let our whole life and our mind be framed by the gospel, when suffering comes, it won't overthrow us. It won't shock us. We we, we won't hate ourselves or hate you. Instead, It'll turn us to gold. Give us, O oh Lord, uh, this ability that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to very, very calmly, not angrily, say, we don't have to defend ourselves, O oh King. We love God for himself alone, and we know he is going to bring us through this. and Make us like them because we trust in the one who went into the furnace for us, Jesus, is, Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Gospel and Life's ministry is supported by generous partners all over the world. Your gifts allow us to share the gospel message with millions of people through our podcast, radio, and other channels, including here on YouTube. We're seeing God change lives through the increasing reach of this ministry, so thank you for your part in it. If you'd like to make a gift today, go to gospelandlife.com slash YouTube, and we'll send you one of my books as thanks for your gift. Thank you again for your generous support because the gospel really does change everything.